Right. Um, so yes, my name's Matt Croucher. I'm an associate director at WSP, and I'm our zero emission mobility lead, um, an electric vehicle specialist within the UK. Um, my background is as a transport planner, um, and I've been working in the uh, in the field of electric vehicles for for over ten years now. Um, and the type of work I cover tends to be looking at forecasting growth in EVs and, and developing strategies to promote EV uptake and associated planning around charge point infrastructure, advising both public and private uh, network uh, investors. Sagar Kanchala, uh, based out of uh, Toronto, uh, Canada. I'm with the advisory services here, uh, leading the energy transition practice uh, uh, in, in Canada. Back to you, Matt. Great, thanks, Saga. Um, right, so I'll just take you through the agenda for the session. Um, so uh, I've just provided our introductions and I was just gonna do a bit, a little bit of scene setting and, and talk around what's driving EV growth um, and, and, and uh, around some of our, the work we've been doing in the UK around EV strategy development and infrastructure planning and some case studies of, of, of some of the work we've been doing there. Um, which goes on to look at, at charge point demand and supply and, uh, and gap analysis, uh, followed by some 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 um, summary of some charge point deployment advisory, um, and then Saga will be taking you through a case study of, of an interesting project we've done for the World Bank, uh, looking at electro mobility in Colombia, followed by some some discussion around charging infrastructure, um, and, and, and concluding with some key takeaways, and then we'll move on to the to the Q and A. Right, so just to kind of set the scene a bit, um, it, it wouldn't be a webinar in uh, 2020 or early 2021 without uh, at least making a passing reference to the fact it's been a fairly remarkable past year, past 18 months or so, um, with uh, a global pandemic and the associated economic shock that that has brought. Some headlines from, from um, the UK here, and uh, I think it's pretty fair to say it's a similar story anywhere where you may be joining, joining us from today. Um, and yet, despite that that backdrop, that ch very challenging backdrop, um, let's move on to the next slide. Um, we've seen uh, a re remarkably um, resurgent and strong um, growth in in EV sales, um, which have, have grown rapidly for a number of years now, and we're really seeing an acceleration in that in that EV uptake. And that's despite the, the the really challenging economic headwinds and, and that we've been through over the over the past year year and a half. And this this particular chart is for the UK, but I, I think it's broadly a similar story wherever you'd be looking. Um, in the UK example we're looking at here, you can see that of the total EV growth, we've seen that real sharp uptick over the past couple of years in particular. And you might notice that the lighter blue line. Uh, which is pure battery electric vehicles actually overtook um, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles in terms of to um, share of total sales um, over the past couple of years as well, which is, is quite a notable transition. Um, if we move on to the next slide. So th there are many reasons for this, and I just wanted to kind of introduce a few of these before we go into, into some of the particular case studies we're looking at. So th there's been strong uh, political support for this and i think even prior to the prior to the um the pandemic some of some of the the the, the trends were, were increasingly supporting strong ev uptake so we've seen glowing growing kind of recognition and urgency around uh, concerns for the climate and climate emergencies um but also prompted by the pandemic um we, we've seen lots of talk of things like building back better um, a, a slogan so good that it's been used on both sides of the Atlantic by our, our Prime Minister and, and, and the US President, um, and prompted by things like the, the figure in the bottom left there, which is showing the impact of uh, lockdown on air pollution. Um, and this happens to be shown in China, but it could be shown in any number of urban areas uh, where without um, such intensive um, internal combustion engine activity, air quality significantly improved. And of course, uh, EVs can play a major part in that and do feature prominently in, in uh, lots of initiatives such as Build Back Better. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so, so that's one factor, the, 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 the political angle. Um, a further thing that's driving growth is, 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 is simply the availability of, of a broader range of models of vehicles and increasing range, um, as you can see in the figure on the right there. Um, as compared to when I first started working in the EV sector back in 2009, vehicles like the, the G-Wiz, that is, um, shown in, in, in central London, uh, were, were one of the few EVs available, uh, kind of 50 mile odd range, um, a very much more limited niche application than we see today. Um, if we move on to the next slide, and um, we see in addition to that growing availability of vehicles, we're also kind of seeing movement in all the right directions in terms of costs. So uh, generally accepted, depending on where you are in the world, that we might see price parity with conventionally fueled internal combustion engine vehicles later in this decade. Uh, and you can see a big reason for that is the fall in, in battery costs in, protect, in particular, which take us below that, that, that common um, threshold with, with internal combustion engine vehicles there, shown by the yellow line. That in conjunction with, with um, ongoing and, and sustained grants from governments and tax incentives to, to reduce the cost of the vehicles, subsidised charging infrastructure and so on. But increasingly as well, um, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, um, in private organisations, um, declaring net zero targets and ambitions to, to reduce their own emissions, uh, it tends to be closely followed by a big shift um, pivot over to fleet electrification. And, and towards renewables and, and green investments. And that's all helped in part as well, but the improving commercial case. So we've got quite a few trends feeding into that, that, that acceleration and EV uptake. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so all of this requires in turn a significant pivot in terms of charging infrastructure. And it shouldn't really be understated how big a change this is, moving from what is currently a very well-established, uh, well-understood, network of refueling stations and, and the associated um, uh, fueling infrastructure, um, well known and well understood by people, um, to a completely different charging ecosystem um, that is still very much evolving and pre presents both opportunities in that there are more places you can charge relative to, to petrol station or petrol fueling stations, but also different challenges and, and different charge rates that, that require understanding and, and, and acceptance from the public. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and, and just moving on to some of the common questions we're, we're asked um, by our clients um, working in the UK. And again, I'm, I'm sure this is a similar story um, wherever you might be looking at EV related projects in the world. Common questions always tend to come back to how many and what type of charger are required and where. Um, be that from the perspective of uh, the, the local government or national government who want to promote the switch to EV or a private um, investor or a, or a property owner, property manager who wants to understand what they need to introduce. Uh, the next question is often then, particularly from the government perspective, uh, where, where uh, will the private sector deliver the charges that we need? And if not, um, what is the role for the public sector in doing that? And then just to move on to an example of, of some of the projects where we've, we've exa answered exactly those questions recently within the UK. So as part of, of EV strategy development and infrastructure planning, we supported a, a very wide range of clients uh, across the full uh, extent of the UK in both the public and private sector side. This focus here is, is on the public sector organisations. Um, and one of the first key steps as part of any of those projects is, is EV uptake forecasting really. And we've just got a few images on the right just to show you how we layer those up. So beginning from um, forecasting uh, using our, our WSP EV ready tool, which allows us to make some very kind of granular and sophisticated assessments of the likely uptake and variations in uptake in EVs across a given study area based on the consumer profiles of that local population, social demographics, but also things like vehicle ownership. So where are the vehicles owned and where aren't they? Uh, what is people's street parking? It's well recognized that not having access to off street parking is a, is a real limitation, certainly at the moment, in terms of people's likelihood and, and willingness to switch. Um, and so we layer on those various different characteristics to ultimately inform the, the last of those figures you can see there on forecast EV uptake. And if we move on to the next slide, um, you can then see that what, what that then enables us to do is, is, is better understand where the future requirements for charging infrastructure are 
um, and what we can do and what we, we, we tend to do uh, regularly as part of, our, part of the projects we work on is then engage with those charge point operators, the investors in the charge point networks to understand what their deployment strategies are, uh, where are they planning to invest and where aren't they? And, and some of their decisive factors uh, tend to often to come down to, to uh, things that will inform the, the viability of, of, of a given site, which often is the proximity to a strategic road or major road where you've got a significant tra passing traffic flow to drive the utilization of those charge points and, and recoup that investment, and where uh, the, the electrical connection to the grid uh, is, is, is reasonable and is not constrained and, 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 and going to require significant investments that, that damage the, the commercial case. So by overlaying the forecast demand with the forecast supply, we can then identify what gaps may emerge and this can be really um, help then the, the, the local or national government understand where they need to make potentially targeted investments to ensure you do achieve that reasonable broad coverage uh, in, in um, charging provision and support that transition to EV. Um, the other thing just to pick up on there's the bottom figure is then highlighting in particular areas where there is forecast to be a reasonable demand for EV uptake but in areas where there's very much a reliance on parking on street with, with rows of old, with narrow terraced streets that are very reliant on publicly accessible charging infrastructure if they're to be supported in making that, that transition. Again, so it allows some real targeted interventions. Uh, next slide, please. So, so just to conclude with some key kind of takeaways in terms of the, 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 the types of um, steer that are provided through these studies, often what we would be tending to say is that there's a real need to focus on establishing that good charge point coverage and plugging gaps at the moment and um, certainly within the, the the uk market there's a, there's a tendency for the, the kind of um most optimal commercially attractive sites to to, to 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 attract investment and charge points but that that will inevitably leave gaps and leave places behind without without some support so helping to identify those areas as i say without access to street parking or, or areas unlikely to attract that private sector investment. Uh, context is key, um, something Saga is gonna pick up as well, I think, and it really uh, essential to understand who, who the different user groups are and what their requirements are, because that has a significant bearing on their, their, their corresponding charging infrastructure. And then right sizing that deployment to make sure that um, you're, you're providing adequate charging infrastructure and, and, and prioritize investment in the right places. Um, further steps then are, are future proofing new developments to make sure that buildings being put up today um, are future proofed to support EVs that we know will, will be need to be supported in the future and really promoting a coordinated approach amongst stakeholders and, and across boundaries to, to ensure that you end up with a, a legible consistent kind of ecosystem for the, for the user to experience. Right. Uh, and just to kind of segue over to, to, to Saga's presentation, um, talking about the, the, the project we, we've done in Colombia, just wanted to kind of highlight here that um, in terms of the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, WSP is very committed to making sure that we support our clients in, in achieving these goals. And uh, many of the EV projects that, that I've touched on there and, and Saga's about to talk about will tend to address a number of these. In particular, as you can see, we've highlighted there that the climate action and, and good health and well-being. Right, I'll hand over to Saga. Uh, thanks, Matt, uh, for uh, providing an overview of uh, the general approach to EV planning and uh, as well as how WSP pursues uh, uh, the EV planning for various clients. In the next few minutes, uh, I'll briefly touch upon a recent project that we completed for World Bank, and then uh, talk about some key takeaways from this project, uh, as well as uh, from other projects that we have completed. Uh, like many governments across the globe, uh, the Colombian government has also established some emissions reductions. And uh, they've realized that uh, electrification of transportation is a key solution to reduce the emissions. Uh, World Bank and the government of Colombia have long partnerships in uh, engaged in the electricity sector, and it was felt that uh, lots of policy framework designs were required in the electricity sector. Uh, the, to move forward with this mandate, uh, uh, World Bank has engaged uh, 
WSP uh, to uh, to develop the policy framework that the government of uh, Colombia could uh, uh, could uh, develop and implement. And uh, this mandate covered various components. And as you can see uh, on the right side of this slide, uh, it, it, it involved looking at the economic impact uh, from any tax changes. It requ uh, looked at regulatory issues, uh, both from a transportation as well as from the energy regulation. Uh, it involved uh, understanding the power infrastructure as well as business models. And it had some challenges uh, considering in uh, Colombia, uh, that uh, electromobility is at a very early stages and then uh, building a, uh, any rapid deployment of uh, EV could put some constraints on the local electricity sector and finally because it involves many participants uh, uh, significant stakeholder interactions is uh, required. Uh, with the time available I'll just pick up two uh, particular challenges uh, during our uh, engagement related to the business models. The first one relates to the access to the public charging infrastructure. And uh, this is an issue across the globe as well with all the developments that Matt has alluded to. Uh, public charging infrastructure is not growing at a pace that uh, it is adequate to meet uh, the global emissions reductions. This charging infrastructure can be seen across, there is this traditional utility infrastructure, and on the right side, you have the charging equipment infrastructure, and, and between there is make-ready infrastructure, whereas uh, stakeholders can participate in, in, in that value chain. And these could be municipalities, utilities, and uh, or even private charging equipment companies uh, that we've seen, like the Tesla's proprietary models. But, and all these companies need to compete and collaborate to develop this infrastructure. One of the challenges that we've seen for the accelerated EV, if there is no clarity in who owns and operates, which piece of the infrastructure development, that would uh, impact the accelerated uh, uh, deployment. And this is true for Colombia as well as for various regions as well. And the next challenge that we've seen relates to the total cost of ownership. And this is particularly true for uh, emerging economies where internal combustion engines are, are more prevalent or more economical uh, because there's a local production, local availability, whereas uh, many of the EV models need to be imported from, uh, from other countries and there are significant tariffs uh, for owning that vehicles. And how we looked at in, in the Colombian project in, in all the components, not just the business models, we looked at the best practices uh, across the globe. And then with the WSP experience, we looked at the Colombian context and they came up with the recommendations for the policy development. Uh, in this case, we looked at various options that could help with, uh, uh, with reducing the burden of uh, cost of ownership. Uh, the high-end EVs, probably they don't require any support, but then uh, they could be government incentives and they could be uh, related to a good carbon signal where they can incentive to return the internal combustion engines and use that credit for uh, a, a owning an electric vehicle. Uh, they could be the, the traditional EV financing uh, of uh, to reduce the initial cap, capital investment. Uh, and even that the regulators can play a role and the utilities to help design the tariff design because the benefits from electric vehicle, uh, for example, like the health benefits are, uh, uh, can be seen by all rate payers. So if some of the common costs of infrastructure can be shared with the rate payers, it reduces the tariff designs for electric vehicle charging. Uh, there could be a subscription model where the ownership is not required, and there could be battery swapping, which reduces the amount of time uh, that uh, uh, the users uh, use time for charging. So looking at these various options, they could be bundled uh, in various ways. And we felt that to be really competitive against the current uh, internal combustion engines and to be competitive, very selective incentives, carbon price signals, and innovative business models need to be encouraged. Those are the two challenges. And coming to the key takeaways from this project or from other projects, we felt that it requires a lot of people-centered EV planning. 
by that I mean for take for example the customer perceptions and preferences as Matt has produced we have the policy uh, support across the globe from various government especially after the COVID build back better you have the technologies developed the prices have declined for uh, for EVs and for the batteries there are significant number of models available as a choice but still the uptake is not at the pace that we would like to see and this is essentially because of uh, the customer's perceptions it could be range anxiety or it could be the preferences of how they want to uh, own and operate uh, an electric vehicle so that should be one of the things that anybody looking at deployment should really listen and adapt to the customer's needs and the second one relates to uh, to the governance there are we've seen this particularly in the Colombian market we had various agencies participate in many of our presentations there are policy makers there are auto manufacturers with the significant number of stakeholders involved without good governance and establishing roles and responsibilities a good roadmap cannot be developed or executed the last uh, uh, key takeaway and this worked especially for WSP and on the Colombian project uh, is really looking at one-stop shop when you're looking at the service provider competences it could be internal or external service uh, ex service providers what worked for the Colombian project is really bringing a 360 degree thinking uh, for this project uh, we had representations from power from transportation from advisory and from engineering from Colombian uh, regions as well as from UK and from Canada as well to deploy successful plans and we feel that uh, a, a 360 degree thinking is desired and, and those are the key takeaways and and before we uh, go to the qu a couple of questions I just wanted to summarize by saying that uh, uh, if you are looking for rapid deployment and for EV planning very people-centered EV planning is essential because at the end the customers the stakeholders and the service providers talent are all, are all uh, people uh, with that uh, uh, we'll, we'll open for some questions uh, live questions or as well as so uh, there are some pre uh, submitted questions that we could respond to as well thank you thank you Sagar and Matt for presentation uh, so before moving into the Q&A period, I would like to remind attendees to enter your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar platform. And also you can download the PDF version of the presentation from the handout box on the dashboard, as well as the recent transitioning to zero emission white paper as well. Uh, so as Sagar mentioned, we received a lot of questions upon registration. We, we will start uh, with the first one. Do we really think that internal combustion engine vehicles will see a rapid decline in sales after 2030, resulting in a huge push of EVs? Yeah, uh, thanks for the questions. And I think this is an applicable across the globe as well. Uh, and uh, my, my thought is I'll wait for Matt's response as well. Uh, I, I truly believe that there will be, uh, be a, a change from, uh, from IC engines. And it's not necessary that only EVs will take that place. Uh, there will be uh, multiple pathways uh, to move away from, I, uh, uh, from internal combustion engines. It could be electric vehicles, it could be hydrogen fuel, it could be a uh, renewable natural gas. Plus always, uh, also it could be driven by the policies. There could be some uh, negative incentives for owning an internal combustion engine. Uh, and that could also move uh, people away from internal combustion engines and definitely electric vehicles would have a significant share uh, but there are other solutions as well to move away from ICs. Anything Matt you want to add to that? Uh, yeah I, I, I agree I mean I, I think you know we'll probably see a, 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 as we have done today a, a, a kind of different pace and different rates of acceleration globally and, and, and particularly within different segments um, I think you know the transition to electric vehicles is you know, really well underway now, and in 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 the kind of light duty segment, um, car and small van segment, and I, and I think the, the 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 kind of commercials of that only continue to look better, really, as as we're now getting that kind of volume production, um, broader range of models, um, improving. Though still more to do, as we've touched on, um, in terms of infrastructure. So I think things are are kind of coalescing around EV for particular segments. And I think you know it, it, there's real momentum behind that now. 
but yeah, I think it, it will probably be a bit patchy, a bit linked to um, uh, what particular governments and initiatives are happening uh, in places as to, as to kind of how exactly that pans out and, and varies. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the UK. Uh, we are building high-rise apartments in Britain without any consideration to charging facilities. What is the plan to change this? Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's something we we um, work with clients a lot on, and, and it's a really important one that you know it, it, now now ten years ago when when there was less certainty around the transition to EV um, and quite at what pace and and in what number that that might happen, it was a bit more forgivable for there to some degree of future proofing in buildings maybe to not be happening, but now it, it kind of feels like a missed opportunity wherever we are putting up new developments and, and not kind of future proofing them for, for what we know is happening. Um, so uh, in, in the UK, the, the government has been looking for some time at introducing some revisions to the building regulations, which would apply nationally um, and would require um, provision of, of charge points within all new um, developments and quite high levels of provision. In residential um, developments, uh, it'd be 100% provision of, uh, for each space, um, and for larger residential um, developments, they'd have to have at least one active charger and passive provision, so all of the kind of cabling and ducting in place for every other bay to be converted as and when required. Um, uh, and then in non-residential developments, there would be a requirement for at least one active charge point. And then 20% of all bays um, having passive provision as well. So, so that's being uh, been consulted on, and, and, and the government is due to be making an announcement quite soon on that within the UK. And I think, broadly speaking, uh, a lot a lot of other countries are, are looking to do or have already done something similar. Uh, the EU is introducing um, uh, uh, regulations for new buildings as well as part of the European Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Um, and, and that's kind of loosely what's what's um, behind the, the UK standards as well. So at the moment, it's not formalised, um, and some lo some local governments, some local authorities have particular requirements, and others don't. Um, but, but I think in time, yeah, we, we, that has to move towards a more uniform uh, kind of minimum requirement. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Sega? Uh, no, it's similar. I think building codes are changing in Canada as well to accommodate. Uh, uh, the EV charging infrastructure. Thank you. There's a question here about Norway. Uh, are there any uh, lessons that we can learn from uh, Norway, which is currently leading uh, in the take up of EVs, if you're familiar? Um, yeah, I mean, there, 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 there are lots of lessons to, to be learned from Norway. I mean, they're, they're, they're well ahead in terms of, of EV uptake, as I think is, is widely known, um, and very ambitious kind of targets in terms of full um, transition to, to pure battery electric vehicle. I think it's 2025, uh, which is amazing, really, compared to, you know, uh, everywhere else. So they've been well ahead. I mean, a, a lot of what's kind of behind Norway's success has, has been very strong kind of um, incentive support to promote EVs and, and, and correspondingly high charges for um, conventionally fueled vehicles. Um, so, you know, that's not always easy for other places to replicate to quite the same degree. Um, but yeah, the, there's certainly kind of lessons to be learned there around strong and sustained and consistent um, government support and incentives to really kind of get that transition underway. Um, yeah, I think there's definitely lessons to be learned there. And, and because they're at that scale now, whether the number of EVs on the road, they're at that kind of next level of charging infrastructure rollout. So kind of very large deployments in, in new developments relative to, to maybe what we're seeing elsewhere. So yeah, the, the, there's, there's some really good lessons to be learned from that, I think. Thank you. Uh, in a few years, uh, would the grid be able to support the demand for the EVs? There's definitely uh, some infrastructure investment required uh, for the grid to, to be able to handle the uh, the electric vehicle infrastructure. Again, I could be biased here, and and when I was presenting on the business models, uh, I come from the utilities, uh, spent significant time, and utilities can play a significant role uh, in 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 developing the required infrastructure. It is okay running some pilots uh, when you are just having a 
uh, uh, type one or type two type uh, 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 chargers, but when you're getting to a fast uh, uh, DC type uh, chargers, uh, then there's significant uh, EV infrastructure is required. And as I was alluding to in the business model, utilities can support and develop the infrastructures for the make ready uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, uh, uh, the, the grid can handle, uh, but it, it, it requires some reinforcement in terms of uh, uh, the infrastructure investment. Thank yeah, you. just just to add to that, I, I think a, a kind of a recurring kind of finding of many studies that have looked into this has been that, that the kind of importance that smart charging can play in, in alleviating some of the challenges um, uh, to, 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 to the grid constraints pose by, by simply enabling vehicles that are, are, are plugged in and charging overnight to, 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 to do so in, in a way that um, uh, can can ultimately respond to signals back from the grid and, and, and really to look, look to kind of manage the load effectively that ekes out a huge amount of, of, of efficiencies relative to, to to kind of upgrades although nonetheless upgrades will still be required in places yeah thank you um, we'll take the last question uh, we have so many more apologies if we cannot take them all uh, in the 30 minute slot uh, of the, the snack and Land webinars but the, uh, these questions will be answered directly by the, the presenters uh, the last question is uh, do we have some idea of the impact of autonomous vehicles and changes to the ownership model for vehicles uh, will have on the need and location of EV charging the impact of autonomous vehicles and changes to the ownership model it's a really good question and a, and, and a challenging one um so yeah it is something that is in the minds of uh, uh, of those of us planning ev infrastructure is it, it can be very tempting to be responding to the demands of today um but i think you know it, it's increasingly important to recognize that um future travel patterns and, and requirements for charging infrastructure are, are probably not as far away as it might always seem and so it does have to be kind of factored into to, to deployments um I, I, I think the temptation is to assume that um it, it potentially lends itself a bit more to a, a hubs type model with um uh, uh, more centralized kind of um, hubs of charging rather than more distributed um but uh, it depends so much on, on, on the exact type of model that, that, that we might be looking at, ranging from fully autonomous vehicles to mobility as a service type um, models. And, and that transition from one to the other, you know, effectively, we're going to have a lot of infrastructure that is delivered ahead of, of those new models and new technologies coming online. So it may be that they seek, seek to make use of an already established ecosystem to a certain extent. Um, but yeah, it's it's a good question and a, and, a, and a challenging one i think that is, is getting more attention um at the moment thank you uh thank you everyone uh we are at the end of our webinar session so please please feel free to follow up directly with matt and sagar via the contact details shown on the screen and i would like to thank all attendees for joining today uh, thank you for your time and uh, thank you matt and sagar for a fantastic presentation Thank you all. Thank you, uh, thank you all for the participants uh, as well. Have a good day. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. I will thank back you. up the webinar now. Thanks.